The planet's puppet masters almost surely have a plan. This clearly may be something near beyond the realm of man. And until you thoroughly tested every last close just. True, Dr. Zayas. Well. Where would we be without THC? Cause we know they're lying to us, just don't know to what degree. Yeah, where would we be without THC? The highest side chat show. Greg Carl Wood Company. Alright, higher side chatters, we've seen by now that to fully explore the things they don't want you to know can truly take a lifetime of independent study. And if you've ever dedicated a sizable amount of energy into examining the deep, dark, and twisted web that spreads across these threads in the near-infinite Pandora's box of subjects like occult esoteric philosophy, symbolism, cosmology, theosophy, Gnosticism, Freemasonry, alternative history, astrology, secret doctrines, hidden motivations, and all the rest of it in this weird world, one of the first things you learn is that you really don't know shit. So I think it's extra important to stay open-minded, absorb multiple opinions, and resist the temptation to jump to conclusions when you're attempting to get a handle on the complex subtext of all things. Well, today we're going to try and do just that because we're going to make an effort to get into the heads of the elite, to try to unravel the mystery religion of the adept occultists that might reside high within the power pyramid, examine how they might see the world, how they might interpret their symbols, and how they might view their role in the big dramatic theatrical production we call life. And here to lead us out of ignorance and into illumination is Michael Joseph, an independent researcher and elite belief system enthusiast who has put together 30 plus hours of excellent and expansive YouTube videos on these very subjects, and I'm psyched to have him here. Michael, my man, welcome to the higher side. Oh, thank you, Greg. I don't know about leading people out of ignorance, <laughs> but, uh, you know, just trying to show different perspectives. That's <laughs> where I'm coming from. For sure, for sure. I like the dramatic flair of the interaction. But... <laughs> well, uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, thanks for being here, man. I really am looking forward to this. I'm ready to go deep, and I think your videos are pretty great. You try to remain objective, and rather than guessing or assuming what something means, you go back to primary texts and read lengthy passages and convey a lot of material from the first-hand sources that we hear referenced so often, but few actually go back and read the works of. And I get it. Life is busy. Cubicles don't fill themselves. But to get us started, what you've done already is a huge undertaking. It could be probably like a three-month course. How did you develop an interest in these subjects and end up going as deep as you have? Yeah, it's uh, just kind of the transitions of life, you know. I guess what really started me looking at anything that would be deemed esoteric was really astrology. And that's something that growing up, I just always thought was complete horseshit. But I always had the exoteric version of it, you know, the horoscope in the newspaper. So obviously, it's easy to debunk that. <laughs> and so what ended up happening was, I don't know, early 20s, my ex girlfriend, she had an aunt or a grand aunt who was an astrologer, a professional astrologer in Vegas. <laughs> and mm. I was just kind of like, hmm, okay, rolling my eyes at that. So apparently, she had told her just my birthday, she didn't have my birth time or anything. And so just from that, my ex-girlfriend relayed to me what she said. And I was just really creeped out by it. Hmm. I was just like, what? It was just so strangely accurate to things that you only internally know about yourself. You know what I mean? And I'm just like, yeah. wait a second. There was so much truth to what it was that I was like, okay, I have to look at this. Now, this could be my mind just making this up. But I was already so skeptical about it. I had no reason to be biased. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So from there, I just kind of started looking at it a little bit, checking out my own birth chart and going to like Astro theme or places like that and just getting basic knowledge of things and seeing how strangely it related to me. So from there, fast forward to, I guess, the waking up, right, to the conspiracy world. <laughs> I really didn't know about any of this stuff until the Boston bombing happened. Wow. Yeah. And, and the thing was, it's strange is like, I already had so many skeptical mindsets about history and the government and stuff like that. But I was working to be a musician. So I really just focused 100% of my time on trying to get better at guitar and things like that. So, you know, my head was down moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. Basically, I had a band at that time, and I was renting a practice space. And the guy who 
ran the space when the Boston bombing happened, I went up and he was listening to the radio and I just walk in there. I didn't really know what to say because I was never really affected by these so-called big traumatic events as much. And so I was just like, bad day, huh? And I could tell he wanted to say something. And then from that led into this two hour discussion of him laying out the new world order to me, (laughs) me and my drummer. And I was not expecting that, but I was really intrigued by it where I think my drummer was freaked out. Mm. And to me, it was like, wow, that's something you don't hear every day. So I was just kind of, you know, interested in hearing this different perspective. And then later on on Facebook, which I'm not really on anymore, but one of my old friends who I used to work with in a restaurant posted something about the Hegelian dialect. I'm like, hmm, what's that? So I Googled that. And that led me to Mark Passio's What on Earth is Happening? Hmm. And I ended up watching all of that immediately. And I was like, holy shit, this exists. <laughs> this explains so many things that I had thought about the world. So I was just really ignorant to the conspiracy world. But if I had known about it beforehand, I probably would have been much more receptive to it, if you see what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so from there, a lot of things happened to me. That was just after 2012. So all of the programs like Red Ice Radio that I found and listened to were, you know, talking about that. So I kind of got into that. And then later on, some things happened in my life and, you know, went through a really, really difficult time. And I started looking heavily at the Orthodox Christian side, because the guy who ran my practice space, he was more in line with that version of the New World Order. So I started looking at Walter Vaith's Total Onslaught series. So this is the more the Orthodox side of things, viewing the New World Order. So I kind of got into that. And then I started looking at more of the esoteric occult stuff because obviously the Orthodox Christians are saying that, you know, everybody's a Satanist, you know, anything that's astrology is evil, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, well, let me look at this stuff and see what I really think about it. And so I've been kind of back and forth in all these different pillars of the conspiracy world, you know, the new age stuff, the Christian stuff, the Gnostic stuff. And so along that journey, I've just kind of absorbed what makes sense to me about them. And the parts that led me into the things that I now discard, I noticed things happening in me that I didn't like, and just internally. And so, okay, maybe there's something wrong with this idea or this ideology, because it's producing bad effects in me, and how I treat other people. So it's always been this internal journey at the same time viewing the external world. And that's kind of where I'm at now, where it's I started researching these things and I'm just like, man, there seem to be a lot of misconceptions about stuff. And I just kind of felt an obligation that maybe I should try to put some of these things out there that might help people in a similar situation that I was, where it's like, okay, people are telling me this is what this means, but well, what about that? And, you know, like the whole thing about the elites worship Saturn, the black cube. Well, why do I read their literature and they seem to be completely anti the demiurge or anti Saturn Satan? So these need to be reconciled for me for my own purposes. And, you know, to sum this up, it's getting long winded. That's just (laughs) where it's at now where I'm just presenting the things that I've looked at giving all the sources so people can make up their own mind about it. And I'm hoping that maybe that helps some people if they haven't been aware of some of these things. Right on. Yeah, man, I definitely like to get a little of that context when I'm talking to people who I just haven't heard a whole lot from, especially them talking about themselves very much. And it seems like you've digested a ton of dense material in kind of a short time. I'm kind of in awe of that. But you refer to your occult series as an exploration of the hidden religions of world organizations. And that is right at the heart of what I find really interesting. And I guess I would ask, do you think it can be summed up into one particular school of thought? Or do you think they're pulling from multiple different worldviews? Yeah, I think the fundamental principles behind all of this stuff is that the exoteric religions, the outer religions, as they call them, there are secrets within those that you can derive the true primitive religion. And that religion is basically of the cosmos, right? This is what the nature of the stars teaches us. And so to sum it all up, I guess I would choose from what I've read from Blavatsky and Pike and people like that, they say that one of the greatest culminations of this was the ancient Greeks and the Alexandrian Gnosis and 
the Neoplatonists and things like that. That seems to be what a lot of this is centered around and Pythagoras. So they say that they get all that information from Eastern religion. And Blavatsky seems to think that the Eastern doctrines of non-dualism and teaching heliocentrism and that the material world is this illusion on the material plane. That's like the primitive religion that all of this derives from. And so all of these cycles of different myths and religions that come up, you can still derive that primitive religion, but you have to look for the hidden meaning. And so that's kind of like hidden things in scripture. So that's what Gnosticism or, you know, Kabbalah is about. And that is the same as nature. So looking at the methodologies of the nature we see, the outer nature, if you look to the inner secrets, that will derive the above. But if you worship the outer nature, you know, the exoteric paganism, which would basically be, okay, we have our nature gods, sometimes they're angry at us, sometimes they like us, and that's all we know of God. That's what would be seen as profane paganism. And so the esoteric paganism would be derived from astronomical concepts and things like that. So that's really the fundamentals of all of this is understanding what's exoteric and esoteric from their viewpoint. And I think that that is really the key to unlocking a lot of this in ways that make more sense. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's where I've been at, where I take that fundamental principle and I just try to read, okay, what does Blavatsky say is esoteric? What does Pike say that is esoteric? What do they say is exoteric? And then anytime they mention a figure in history and this is why in the series, when you get to Giordano Bruno and Hypatia, it's very interesting how the people at Cosmos, like DeGrasse Tyson and Sagan, they're giving you the mystery religion version of history. And I just find that very strange, whereas the scholarly world has a very different viewpoint. So I like putting all these things side by side, and I just kind of let the audience filter out what makes sense to them as to why those discrepancies are there. Yeah, and that's fair. And obviously, this is so deep. But to kind of elaborate on that point about Neil deGrasse Tyson and him teaching the mystery religion, I think some people might be a little surprised by that perspective, because I think the common perception is that he would be an atheist, that he's uh, one of these guys promoting material atheism. But that might not be the case, right? Yeah, and that's the genius of it to me is because to me, this is what I see happening with it, is the occultists view people who are atheistic as kind of the most profane, because they're at the bottom of the chain, they're the devil card in tarot. And I like to use the two tarot cards of the devil and the lovers to convey a lot of these ideas. Everything that is exoteric is the devil card, everything that is esoteric is the lover's card. So basically, the altruism of Prometheus is giving you know, the divine intellect of the lover's card, the gnosis, to the profane man. And that is the sacrifice that is indicated on the Lucius Trust website on the United Nations and littered throughout all esoteric philosophy. And so that's kind of what Baphomet represents to me, is you're uniting profane man to deity. And, you know, it's going to create this chaos, but from that will become a more divine order. And it's this cycle of doing that in the process of alchemy. So that seems to be, in my opinion, what they're trying to do to the human race. So with the atheists being so enamored, and again, I'm not making a comment on people who are atheists or anything like that. I'm just saying strictly from their viewpoint. Yeah. They are kind of being indoctrinated without knowing it because they are looking up to the heavens, right? They are looking up to the cosmos. And if you read Copernicus and all these guys, they're all saying, the more you look up, the lesser you will get away from the profanity of man's sinful nature in the lower realms. Mm -hmm. And so I think they view that they are trying to initiate people into the mysteries. And it's a slow process of indoctrination. And it's very interesting because what do the, all of these people who are enamored with science and atheism do? They're attacking all of the exoteric religions. So in some sense, they are attacking the enemies of Freemasonry. So they're kind of being used in this way. And this is kind of interesting with Gnosticism because that's kind of the view of the Demiurge. There is a purpose for him and his mode of consciousness, but it's being used from a higher level to do that. And so you can kind of see that concept playing out with all of the people constantly fighting with each other. 
And that's what I'm trying to say is, you know, everyone's fighting over a lot of things that maybe we're all getting our strings pulled from something else and we're attacking what seems to be the visible problem, not the hidden problem, you know? Right. And I do think that's really interesting. Like I've had a lot of guests talk about the deity flip, the idea that the Abrahamic religions are actually worshiping a negative entity, which turns out to be like the Demiurge, you know, they're worshiping the lower God, the material dualistic God. Dualism is a big, mm -hmm. uh, and I do think the atheism component is interesting because it's like when you source back the big bang theory, one of the tenets of atheism that kind of got a lot of people on that path, it comes from a Vatican astronomer. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like if the Vatican is preaching that you should uh, worship the Demiurge, and then they're also coming up with the atheistic paradigm, it's kind of like these two ideas, the science and religion thing, we think of them as so different. They come from a similar source, and they're both thought from the occult view to be lower worldviews, lower ideas. Is that right? Well, here's the interesting thing. I think it's in video 6.0 and 6.1. I talk about the Big Bang. And that theory, everything that, what's his name, Lemaitre, I think, is talking about the primeval atom and the cosmic egg. That is actually, when you read Blavatsky and Pike and all those guys, it, it's almost like he derived it from them. So the Vatican is weird because to me, they serve an exoteric function where it's like, okay, people will point their finger at them and say, you know, they're all about the literalism of the Bible, right? But to me, this is where the Knights Templar story comes into play. And I don't really want to get into that now because it's going to get sidetracked. But <laughs> basically, I think there's an exoteric and esoteric component to the Vatican where I see a lot of Gnostic symbolism coming from them, but that's the hidden part of it. Now, I know that might freak out some people, but I'm just saying that this is what I get from the literature when I apply it. But the point being is that are they perverting that or there's different ways of looking at it. So somebody's into Gnosticism, not saying that you're following the wrong religion or something. It's way more complex than that. Yeah. And the Orthodox, I completely sympathize with the people who say the Orthodox versions produce duality because, I mean, let's just face it. There's a lot of stuff that comes from the Orthodox camp that, I just, I can't resonate with it all. But I do think that a lot of the points that they make are valid with certain things, but the literalism and, and you have to believe that Jesus is a literal person, you know, I, I just, I can't, I can't go, I, you know, I can't go with that. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so I completely sympathize, but sometimes I wonder if maybe the exoteric has been created by the people running it to project something to become this straw man of what the creator is to bring them into their side. Sometimes I think about that. I don't know. That's just a, an idea. But it's very strange because if they're the ones controlling all this, what can you trust? <laughs> you know? Right. There's, there's so many layers and neither of us are initiated. So we're dealing with games within games. Mm -hmm. We're dealing with exoteric and esoteric symbols that have dual meanings, meanings at different levels, different degrees of initiation. So, yeah, I mean, it's very complex and it's just good to try on the different hats and try to figure out, you know, how things work. But to add even another layer here, I mean, when you're citing people like Pike and Manly P. Hall and maybe even Crowley to some extent, these people are thought to be bound to secrecy for their orders. I mean, can we trust their public facing work? Yeah. And, you know, that's pretty much up for anybody to decide individually on their own. But where I'm coming from is that, to me, what I'm reading from Blavatsky and Pike, as far as I know, that's the best we can gain as an insight to the world, simply because they got a statue of Albert Pike. That's kind of important. <laughs> <laughs> He's a Confederate general, and everybody hates the Confederacy nowadays, but nobody's criticizing that statue. How ironic. And then the Lucius Trust Foundation, which is associated with the United Nations and their philanthropy, they're following Blavatsky's teachings openly on their site, but how many people know about that site? So, you know, you could say they're perverting the teachings or not. I don't really care, but I'm just saying that that's the reason why I chose looking at those so much. And when I read those passages and I look at the world, it's just like, holy shit, look how well this matches up. So 
that's kind of where I'm coming from with that. And then the secrecy part of it is this is where I try to take it based on what we know from them. What if we start using their system and maybe when we're presented a symbol, try to come up with our own explanation from their mindset. So don't rely on everything they say, but use their general foundational principles and try to derive things. So this is what I try to do a lot with the tarot symbolism and Baphomet and stuff like that. I try to apply what I know about esoteric philosophy to something that makes more sense to me sometimes than what we've been told. I'll give a perfect example. You know, the, the Mithra slaying the bull? Mm -hmm. You see that at the Vatican Museum. And what I've read about that from Manly Palmer Hall doesn't really quite make a lot of sense to me in context with a lot of the other stuff. But what does make sense to me is that it's the essence of the highest spiritual son slaying the base desires of the earthly nature of man. So it's like the compass slaying the desires of the square. And that's a process of alchemy and unifying them. And the bull represents Taurus. And so Taurus in its negative sense is possessions, finances, sexual lust, things of that nature. And this relates to the Moses allegory of the golden calf. In the esoteric world, Moses condemning the Israelites for worshiping the golden calf means that Israelites worship the demiurge because they don't understand the symbols and they're worshiping a false god. They're being idolatrous. And so Moses is an initiated one trying to reveal the highest god, but they're just profaning it. So that's an allegory for that. And then, you know, profaning these things leads to excessive materialism and all this stuff. And so what's very interesting is that Pope Francis used that allegory when he came over to the West and told us how we're all too greedy. And he used the golden calf as an example of this story. So he was actually using the esoteric context of that story. So that's what I think is weird. Here's a Vatican guy using the occult version of that. And, you know, it's just stuff like that. It just weirds me out. And Pope Francis, I don't want to get into it, but I fucking can't stand that guy. He, <laughs> he makes my blood boil when I hear him talk. It's so hypocritical. And I just, you know, I, I, I can't even begin to describe how much I despise his role that you see right now. It's just, just such self-righteous hypocrisy, in my opinion. <laughs> right on, man. So... To backtrack just a bit here, we have this idea that the Abrahamic religions are tricking the masses into worshiping this lower being, the Demiurge, this creator of the material trap, thinking it's the highest god. I'm very into that idea. Then to take it further, we have this Lucifer, Prometheus, serpent in the garden archetype, who they have demonized, but is actually trying to help us, to elevate us, to enlighten us to a higher understanding, despite the Demiurge's wishes that we remain ignorant and loyal. Now, with that said, if we fold in the symbols of the elite, like, for example, a Prometheus statue at Rockefeller Center, it seems like quite often the elite are invoking these light-bringing, humanity-freeing Prometheus Lucifer archetypes who sacrifice themselves to give knowledge to humanity, but why would they do that? Do they see themselves as enlighteners? Is this some facade they hide behind? Are we misjudging the characters? Because their methods and actions don't really seem to line up with the mythological archetypes they promote, you know? Oh, I hear you, man. This is what I call the Sphinx of the Mysteries right here. <laughs> they use that term a lot. But why do they seem to feel like they are righteous and doing us a favor in their literature but we see all this awful shit happening. And, you know, this is very complex, but I'll try to give some perspective here from what I've seen in the research. When I read some of Crowley's writings on alchemy, he talks a lot about in the process of white magic, part of the alchemist's goal or their joy is taking the most profane elements and turning them into Godhead and bringing them to the state of the, quote, black dragon, you know, basically poisoning the material. And then the further in the material push it, the greater the triumph rising out of that. And, you know, if all of this uh, cult stuff are allegories for human consciousness, then could that be applied to the profane masses that we're being poisoned deliberately to bring us to a moment of enlightenment. And this is why I use the movie, The Game, a lot, and Fight Club as well, in relation to this. Because 
if you think about the movie, have you seen the movie The Game? No, I just heard you talk about it in your videos. Well, I, I definitely suggest watching it. It's a David Fincher film. He also directed Fight Club. So the idea is that Michael Douglas is this bigwig millionaire guy, and he's kind of depressed, and you know he's basically trapped in the material world. Mm -hmm. And there's this whole initiation process that goes through it where he stops caring about material things through this game, and he comes out enlightened and now he just wants to meet the wizard behind the curtain as he says he doesn't care about the money that he thinks he lost and so there's this whole setup that makes him think that all these people are attacking him and there's all this awful stuff but it's just this way to foster enlightenment and this has to do with alchemy and to me there's like these exoteric and esoteric versions of it but one of them for the exoteric seems to be that they seem to think that if you're in your greatest mode of darkness, you will, out of sheer emotion, bite into spiritual gold based off a of pure instinct. And that is like this way to foster enlightenment. In Fight Club, where he's burning Edward Norton's hand with the lie, that's like dissolving the body, like Baphomet, dissolve and coagulate. So you're dissolving the material. This is symbolic. Yeah. And he's like, this is your greatest moment of enlightenment, man. And you just want to be off somewhere else. And to mm -hmm. me... This is revealed through a lot of Hollywood movies where a lot of people are descending into darkness and then there's these moments that are supposed to be illuminatory and then they come out of that. And I just wonder if that is part of what they're doing because there's all of this profane materialistic stuff pumping out of Hollywood. But then there's all these esoteric things like through the Matrix and the game and stuff like that that are kind of contradictory to that. So. It's just very weird that I just wonder if this is part of their plan and their knowledge of alchemy and what they're doing. And their goal is, in their minds, universal philanthropy and freeing us from the confines of the world of the Demiurge, or at least what they project it to be. You know, the government, all the things the Archons represent, fear, anxiety, whatever, everything that's of Saturn in the negative sense. And so, you know, I, I can resonate with a lot of those things, which is weird, but the way it's being implemented, it's just like, this is fucked up, you yeah, know? Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of like, this is the way I look at it sometimes. You take a word, right? Like freedom. Everybody listens to the word freedom is like, yes, freedom, that's good. But everybody has a different definition of how that is implemented. And so that's how they get us with 9-11. Oh, we're going to go fight those terrorists for freedom. So everybody's so caught up on the macro, they don't see that the details aren't really matching up to what freedom is. But that's how you kind of blind people. And this is what I just wonder, you know, the ideas of these things, they sound nice and lofty and true, but the way they're being implemented, that's where people really start to decide, well, is this, is this real or not? Is this good or not? You know, right. and I, I think that that's kind of... You can have the mindset of being self-righteous or, you know, altruistic, but how is that being implemented? And just to give a quick example, think about like the social justice warrior. They're fighting for all of the things that I agree with, but the way they implement it, you know, and I'm, and I'm being stereotypical here. I'm not saying they're all like this, but there's a certain faction of extremity that it's just like, you know, they want everything to be racist. Any moment a white person, a black person interact with each other, it must be racist. And the, the white person must be enacting white privilege on them. And I'm just like, you're racist. You can't stop thinking about race. You're the one that's racist <laughs> and you're projecting on everybody else. You know, I've had I've had discussions with people like that where I was given hypothetical questions like if you saw a white police officer arguing with an African-American person, would you use your white privilege to go over there and stop that oppression? I'm like, well, how do I know it's oppression? What if the African-American punched somebody in the face for no reason and the guy's arresting him? And how condescending to think that he would need you to go over there yeah. and handle his situation. And, and so, but the point being is that the person that's telling me this, I'm like, dude, I have to see the situation and objectively understand if I feel like something bad is happening. But in their mindset, it had to be oppression and that the righteous thing for me to do was to go over there and stop it. And I'm just like, that's not righteous. That's <laughs> fucked up. So, so what I'm saying is the idea of what is righteous is there, but the way it's being implemented is like, I don't think so, man. You know what I mean? And I, I, I was basically called a person who's closed minded and, you know, they, of course they, they're telling me that history proves all these. And I'm just like, dude, you are being so hypocritical right now. 
I'm trying to tell you that you're the one who can't see that. And so it becomes this argument that you're never going to break any ground. So you just have to step away from, but at the same time, that kind of shows how these ideas and concepts of good sounding things being implemented. That's where it, it gets fuzzy where the details manifest. <laughs> it, it does get a little strange. And I mean, to use another example, based on the elite, we have these campaigns that on the surface look like international philanthropy, but then it seems to be a Trojan horse for eugenics programs mm -hmm. and other manipulative things. So yeah, it is tough to get a good read on it, but I did bring up to you the Hidden Hand saga where a supposed representative of the elite came to answer questions on a forum a few years ago. I thought this was super intriguing, and ultimately this Hidden Hand person said that the elite are in positions of power and control and suppressing the masses as a type of altruistic sacrifice to facilitate <laughs> true will for the people, a sort of maybe a justification for their actions, to which the Hidden Hand said that certain families agreed to fill the roles on a cosmic level well before they manifested here, almost sounding like they agreed to play the role of Archons to some degree, but it's weird. Does that jibe at all with your understanding of things? Dude, I am so glad you mentioned that to me, because I went and read that last night, and I was kind of blown away, <laughs> because... I felt like I was reading verbatim a lot of the stuff that I've been reading with Blavatsky and, and some of the other writers, not in every instance, but enough of it where I was just like, oh, my God. And whether or not that's legitimate or not, I view it kind of like Albert Pike's World War Three letter. I don't know if that's real or not, but it is kind of strange that that's exactly what's happening, <laughs> you know. And so that kind of blew me away. I read through a lot of that, you know, I, that to me makes a lot of sense as to their viewpoint now that begs the question are they right <laughs> you know right and yeah. i'm one of those people where i don't think so i think they're on an ego trip that's my personal opinion if somebody disagrees with that that's totally fine i can understand that but that's that's something that you've mentioned like it, it can seem in my work that i'm an elite apologist when i'm absolutely <laughs> not but i'm trying to be objective when something might not be as nefarious as people make it out to be. And that's why I like, you know, Aleister Crowley, perfect example. Looking at the Christian side of it, they all want to think that he ate babies or something, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm like, okay, let me read his writing. All of that child sacrifice stuff was just symbolic. You know, he's very cryptic and, and kind of sarcastic and, you know, likes being clever and probably likes fucking with people's heads. So, mm -hmm. I would think that from the mindset of Crowley, if he viewed Christians as thinking he actually literally sacrificed babies, he would think that he had done his job because that's amusing to him. He's like, that's so far from the truth that it's just hilarious that these people would think that. I feel like they find these things amusing that people jump to a lot of these insane conclusions about certain things. But again, this inevitably leads to the dark occult stuff and the pedophilia things and what that really could mean. And that's something I don't really want to get into right here, but I tend to be in the middle with that somewhere where I think that there's, you know, legitimacy to those things and also maybe an element of fabrication as well. It just depends. And I think there's a lot of different ways to view it, but I sort of land in the middle of it, but I don't know for sure. So I'm not going to tell you that that stuff is real or it's not. I just think it's a lot more complex than a lot of people make it out to be. Fair points. So, Sometimes I have guests who talk about the founding of America from the perspective of these adept occultists, that they were actually like trying to magic their way into a new era with this new Atlantis, new world concept. Mm -hmm. Of course, Freemasons were a heavy influence on America's founding. And in that sliver of time, I can see it being an attempt at a noble act. But outside of that example, I'm not sure I see a moral alignment between some of their... I guess, religion and their actions. It's hard to know because, again, we have groups within groups, games within games. But what do you think of that era in the attempt to start a new Atlantis, new world concept? Do you think that was them trying to create a haven for enlightenment, a, a new Atlantis to a degree? Yeah, I think that's the mindset of them just based on what I read. And then my Elaine Pagels video, I make the connection that She's talking about the Demiurge 
and how that represents false authority and monarchy and things like that, the false crown, right? And so the initiates declare their independence from that force, and that is the celebration of freedom. So what I think is very strange is that that to me is the esoteric version of the Declaration of Independence and what we celebrate in the 4th of July. But ironically, it's all about their religion. So you're not really free from religion, but they view their religion as being freedom. And so I just think from that perspective, that's what I would gather. Now, whether or not that was what happened, I don't know. But I'm just applying the literature to the symbology that we see and I think the holiday stuff is very strange, too. I think there's an esoteric, exoteric component to a lot of the holidays. Yeah. And, you know, it's just very interesting how that idea, like a like perfect example, the Freedom Tower, right? We had the twin pillars of polarity that were separated. And then in 9-11, they were disappeared and they were merged into one and freedom, right? Freedom from what? if the duality of the pillars represents the demiurge and they're merged into one pillar representing unity, which is basically their whole philosophy, the highest essence of deity is the perfect union of the opposites. Is that an allegory for them and their unity of consciousness, or at least what they think their unity is? And then our version is, oh, we're free from them terrorists who attacked us. You know what I mean? It's just sort of like using the literature that makes sense to me as how they would view it. Now, whether or not that's actually how they view it, I don't know. But, you know, you can make the applications all over the place once you understand their system. Right. And I do actually love your 9-11 ritual analysis. It's, it's pretty interesting. And just like you pointed out, I can understand this idea of collapsing the dualistic structure and building a single freedom tower. I get the concept, replacing profane dualism, Saturnian, demiurgic stuff with higher level oneness. But 9-11 also seems to have been the catalyst for a lot of Saturnian archonic control schemes like the Patriot Act, increased surveillance, the TSA. So, I mean, how should we think about that piece? Well, you could view that a lot of different ways. One, maybe they're just so delusional and they blame all of those things on us. You know, you've probably heard a lot of researchers talk about the law of karma and how maybe they manipulate things to get us to be the ones that make the decision to go to war and somehow they're free of that. Yeah. I think there's something to that. Now, whether or not that is reality or just what they think that they're free of, I don't know. But it seems very interesting because they constantly blame war and famine and all of these things on us the profane people if you read the literature they just shit on us constantly <laughs> and so this is where i think is interesting about if you read the new testament and these are some things i resonate with from the more orthodox side where i view reading stuff from jesus as just literature like i'm reading crime and punishment or something now that's the most blasphemous thing you can say in orthodox religion but i don't care that's just how i view it <laughs> so I just like to separate what makes sense to me or not. And the woes to the Pharisees, I think, are very interesting because they say that they lay heavy burdens upon men's shoulders, but they don't lift the finger themselves. So basically, they just project everything onto the people and act like they're self-righteous. So I wonder if maybe some of that's what's going on. I'm not sure. But what is interesting is that, you know, 9-11, what happened after they told us that, oh, we need to go out and buy stuff. <laughs> that will show those terrorists. Materialism, Saturnian shit. Yeah, exactly. So here's the interesting thing. If you apply the alchemical ideology of pushing the profane people further into darkness, and that is beneficial to the elites to use in alchemy, it's almost like they are like the archons where they feed off the negative energy, but I think the way that they think that they're using it is a lot different than most people do. So... You know, they let all of the exoteric people in that. That was one of the things when 9-11 happened. I couldn't believe my eyes. They're selling like freedom pins on QVC and people are writing yeah. songs and making all this money. I'm just like, oh, my God, what the fuck? We're going to war the next day. Like, it was very strange to me. But at that time in my life, 
you know, I'm like, okay, everything's fucked, whatever. I'll move on with my life. But <laughs> all those things, I would just, I was just completely blown away by that. But what's very interesting is that if that is a ritual in some fucked up way to foster enlightenment, it's kind of weird because I started realizing all this material stuff that's happening is really awful. So it actually worked on me. And I, I hate saying that. You know what I mean? 9-11 woke me up. Right. It makes you realize that there was this awful materialistic element. So I agree with that. I mean, I'm not really a very materialistic person, but I'm not one of these people who's like, sell all your possession and go live in the woods. I, I you know, I try to be balanced about it, but it's really strange. And what happened on 9-11, I, you've had a guest on talking about the astrology of it. And I'm going to do a series on 9-11 later on when I have time, but Basically, Saturn was in Gemini, so Saturn, the Demiurge, in between the two pillars of duality, and it was having a return. So when they opened the World Trade Center, it was almost in the exact same spot. I think it was like 14 or 15 degrees Gemini. And the opposition is Pluto. Now, in tarot, Pluto is like the Holy Spirit. It's the uh, sheen flame, the divine fire. You know, It's so divine that it breaks down all the material structures because that's the essence of the all-consuming deity. And so that's what Pluto represents. Now, people think, oh, Pluto, Hades, underworld. I think that's exoteric in terms of the astrology of it. I think the outer planets, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, are seen as more divine and non-dualistic. And then once you get into Saturn and into the inner planets, that's where duality happens, based on what I've learned. But Pluto was the opposition. And so that's like the divine fire that breaks down material form. <laughs> and, you know, the divine jet fuel fire that broke down all the material form of the World Trade Center. You know, I don't know. I sometimes I wonder if that's just an allegory for an astrological alignment. But either way, that's very strange. And then another part of my video, it's 6.1, video 6.1 on the celestial sphere. They had the sphere in between the two pillars, which is basically what Atlas holds up, like at Rockefeller Center. Right. And so that was cracked or broken. And that's part of the whole Big Bang theory and breaking the Orphic egg. And that's spiritual achievement or the phoenix rising out of the ashes, you know, the uh, initiate learning of the highest God and, you know, everything that's represented in the lover's card, breaking that celestial sphere is cracking that. So how strange that that cracked during that event. And then they moved it to Battery Park and lit an eternal flame, just like they did for JFK, the eternal flame, sheen flame, spark of Prometheus. I don't know, but it's weird how... <laughs> Rockefellers have Prometheus and Atlas, and then they are the ones that, you know, basically built the Twin Towers, and they had the sphere in between them that cracked. It's just weird shit, man. <laughs> yeah, they're invoking some weird philosophy, but it is such an interesting and all by thorny perspective. But you are right that I guess I could say to a degree that I lived in ignorance before 9-11, and that really was a pivotal awakening moment and you could also tie in the very fringe and far out idea that nobody really dies at these false flags that nobody really died at 9 11 that those planes were empty and there's even some people who say that the building has only a couple of floors that large parts of those buildings were empty and i mean this is just a really far out idea that some people say but if that turned out to be true you could then say oh well this trauma is kind of illusionary to wake people up. It's very weird, but I, I wanted to point out also in your videos, I find it really interesting, your analysis of that black cube symbol. Of course, it's a Saturnian symbol. A lot of people look at those cubes and say, oh, see, they're Saturn worshipers. But the way you talk about it is they're not worshiping it when they put it at the base of the Freedom Tower. They're symbolically overcoming it or being above it or in Mecca, there's the black cube, but it has the gold trim, the gold strip. They're trying to alchemically elevate the Saturnian symbol, I guess, from their perspective, right? Yeah, and that's all very interesting stuff you said. And I guess we could go down the 911 road. Why not? <laughs> Fuck it. Basically, the whole idea about no planes and nobody dying, th that's very interesting to me. I don't make definitive conclusions. I'm not going to tell you that nobody died or that. Right. We'll never know. We'll never really know. But those perspectives, I think, are very interesting in relation to this. So you could always say maybe they tried to do that, but it didn't work. But first of all, the planes, there's some weird numbers going on there. 
And what I think is very interesting is Flight 93 that descended into matter and basically obliterated. You can't find it. That's the Thelemic number, right? Right. And so if 93 is the divine will, that's the will of deity that comes from thy will be done in the New Testament. That's the Greek word for it. And so that's why it's seen as the essence of the God above the Demiurge, because in occultism, Jesus Christ is teaching of the highest father and Orthodox Christians make the mistake that he's teaching of the Old Testament God in the revealed sense. He's teaching about the concealed one. That's the viewpoint. So Jesus is extremely important to occultism as much as Orthodox Christians are sometimes confused on that. But point being is that if this is all about this divine entity sacrificing itself, going into the material world and it's united 93, right? It's uni- like the, the unified deity descending into matter, but it just kind of obliterates. There's no hmm. trace of it. And what happened was, I think in the movie poster, I was reading all of these people unified into one to fight whatever, and this is their great sacrifice. So I'm like, wait a second. You know, on the UN website, Lucifer, solar, angelic entity of the sun, of the highest will, and that's descending into matter as a great sacrifice. I just wonder if the 93 flight symbolically was representative of that. Hmm. And Pluto, if that's the divine fire enacting and obliterating the, the World Trade Center, it's very strange how well they collaborate. <laughs> and to bring it to the Black Cube, and this is all stuff that I'm going to integrate into the 9-11 series when I get to it. I have some things already set up for it. But with the Black Cube, we have in Mecca, you know, it's a black cube with some gold around it. Mm-hmm. I'm a fan of the band Tool. If you heard this on The Grudge, it's Saturn ascends, choose one or ten. So you're going to choose the black or the gold. And they're separated. They're dualistic, right? But that's the part of alchemy or unifying it into one. So if they're using a profane doctrine like Abrahamic Islam to attack, and then what happens as a result is these two inverted cubes where the pillars were into the earth, It's kind of like obliterating a profane doctrine and then unifying it into one with the true esoteric doctrine of the monad or whatever. And that's this weird thing with it that Saturn is associated with fear, anxiety, and terror and stuff like that. So if they think that Islam worships the Demiurge, then they use that archetype in their ritual. And there you go. They have to use these profane things in these alchemical acts because that's the whole nature of it. Hmm. You're unifying Godhead to the profane. So in the astrological alignment, you're unifying Pluto, which Crowley associates with Keter and Kabbalah, which is the highest sphere. I think that's correct. And so if Saturn is, you know, whatever, the, the demiurge, the shit god, you're unifying those with that opposition and you're bringing it together into one. And so the astrology just tells the story, you know? Yeah, <laughs> it is definitely deep. And another thing I wanted to talk about while we're on this dualism versus oneness set of worldviews, to switch gears a little bit, I like how the flat earth, globe earth paradigms tie into this occult philosophy dichotomy. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, sure. On... uh the godly globe in the profane plane. I think it's video four. Basically, that's the meaning of the compass and square. And again, I, I say this as symbolically. All of these things represent similar themes of consciousness. So all the things that are deemed as profane, and what I mean by profane is the separateness. So you can be a good, nice person on one hand, but then you have a dark side. So that's like the shadow of the light and its manifested side. And you got to try to get rid of that shadow and unify it into one. And that is what, you know, eliminates sorrow and suffering. That's kind of like the philosophy behind it. So the nature of man or earth is profane. That's the shadow. So if we have the demiurge creator archetype creates out of this false ego and separates itself then that shadow will be cast onto earth. So that means that the earth will be dualistic because it was created by a dualistic intent or, or God or, or consciousness, right? And so Albert Pike talks about how the first and last lesson of Freemasonry, like the Alpha and the Omega, are what the compass and square represent. And he says that the square represents 
plane geometry, which is profane. So, you know, of squares and cubes and stuff like that. And the cube represents earth. And then juxtaposed to the spherical trigonometry, which is divine of the compass of the heavens. So unifying a flat earth model to a globe earth model would be the same thing as 9-11. You're just performing alchemy. You're applying divinity to something profane and unifying it. And I think that's very strange because that's symbolic. So this is where, you know, the flat earthers might argue, well, are they just making this symbolic? And if they think the material world's an illusion and all is consciousness, then all that matters is what people believe about it. Wouldn't that just be symbolic to them? And that would be a motivation for faking it. Now, that's something that would lend to that argument. Or you could say on the other side, maybe the above science is as the below and they know that. And that's just reflected or, you know, there's a lot of different ways you could take that, <laughs> but it is very interesting. I just like to assign the, the lover's card to the compass or the sphere and the devil card to the square, because metaphysically as a mode of consciousness, that's what it represents. And this is what's so strange is because all of this conflict that's risen from this flat earth argument is polarizing things. So I just wonder if that's being used for some sort of alchemy down the road, I don't know, but it's very strange how they need to polarize things to unify. It. And that's what the, the hidden hand dude said, Yeah, that that's the nature of everything that they do. And I'm just like, I, when I read that, I'm like, oh my fucking God, are you serious? Is that, uh, sorry if I swear. No, but... it's cool. <laughs> We're adults. It, it was just, it was everything I've been reading was just kind of reaffirmed there. And there's this quote in 1984, I believe. It's like, you know, the, the best books are the ones that reaffirm what you already know, something to that effect. And that's what I think I like. It's like when I, I have these thoughts about things and then something sort of reaffirms that, it just gives me comfort that, okay, I'm not that crazy. Somebody else has thought of this. <laughs> you know what I mean? So right. that's kind of why I like that quote. So I think that kind of applies to this. Yeah, man. So I actually thought that was super interesting. The stuff about the Freemasonic square and compass and the square measuring things on a 2D flat plane and the compass being used to measure circles or representing the spherical view. It's just so amazing. And I think that Nexus is really fascinating. And we have to remember how old this philosophy or occult religion really is, because I guess what I'm taking away from this is that the Demiurge rules this material world prison planet illusion, and because it's all an illusion, it's structured to look flat with us in the middle. As you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's perfect to fuel the ego, because if nobody told you anything, it would feel like you were in the center of the universe, and that's part of the trick. This would be like the most base level, five cents understanding, and one that the masses probably had for a long time. But the point is, I guess there's been this secret tradition among the elites where they've looked deeper, seen through the demiurgic illusion and behind closed doors going back who knows how long the elite have known the truth and didn't share it with the profane masses. I guess is that the idea? Is that one perspective? Uh, yeah, and maybe I can offer another one in connection with that. So if these mystery traditions believe that they have the truth and that this world is an illusion they're kind of shaping it how they believe it to be true right through human consciousness and stuff like that and, and in our awareness and so the question is with the demiurge and everything that we talk about with shedding the ego oh this is what i want to talk about okay shedding the ego right this is something i completely resonate with in gnosticism where you want to get rid of the things that are your own egoic will holding you in the way from understanding things. This is something that's related to my life many times, you know, mm -hmm. when, when I finally been like, okay, maybe I was wrong about this and I was an idiot for thinking. So all of a sudden, all these things open up to you that answer questions that you never really knew before. I resonate with that a lot, but this kind of gets back mm -hmm. to the idea of, you know, like I said, freedom's a word. How is that implemented? So shedding your ego, that is a concept, but how is that implemented? Because what I think is very interesting about a lot of this esoteric stuff, it comes across as really arrogant sometimes. Yeah, very condescending. Are you really shedding your ego? Is that what you think you're doing? <laughs> but you can still learn 
from all of this literature in a very profound way. And this is what I think is another perspective I'd like to add. I'm not saying that this is the way it is or anything like that, but just something to consider is what if the elites are all of the attributes of what Demiurge is in Gnosticism, but they are actually the duplication and their God they think is the one is actually the copy. And that the way all of this implements that a lot of people who are into Gnosticism resonates with there's actually a force above that that is letting all of this happen for a divine reason in the end. Now, here's what I think is interesting. What if that force is actually the creator of the material world? <laughs> and this force that thinks that it's the, the highest creator, the grand architect or whatever, is actually the projection of its own ego. And so when you get all these exoteric religions bashing the creator... Maybe that bashing is just that force's projection of that. So, for example, say there's some guy who I don't like, and I just go up to somebody and be like, hey, you know that guy? He's a child molester. Yep, totally. I know it. I saw it happen. And I could have made that up completely. But the perception from that person I told, that will be tainted of that person big time. Yeah. So what if they have slandered the creator of the material world through all the exoteric religions and made it seem so crazy that that is the candy, the straw man to bring people into their mystery religion <laughs> to exalt the actual duplication. See what I'm saying? So this is yeah. why I resonate with the orthodox version of Lucifer, just in a mode of consciousness, not taking anything literally here. I'm not saying it's an actual winged angel or anything, but just an intelligence that was created as the most divine, beautiful, charming, charismatic entity but it was corrupted by that, thinking it should be the highest God. And so there is this idea that that entity fooled a bunch of people into following it. And what if what we're in right now is this entity's chance to prove itself? And all it does when it fucks up is it blame it all on all these profane people. <laughs> but we are able to witness this and we can derive truth from the reflection. And since it's so close, to the top source it's like anything that is great and quality and everything but they use all of those amazing qualities for their own ego but they want to trick you into thinking that they're helping you like for example you know somebody sees somebody coming at them with a baseball bat and really angry at them you know okay this guy is out to get me i'm going to run away that's bad right mm -hmm. but if somebody comes up to you with flowers and like hey how are you doing but they have a knife behind their back and they won't give you the knife until you actually act in a way that they don't want you to, then you just think that they're your friend. And so maybe that is the essence of what the elites are actually following. But all the concepts that we learn in a lot of Gnostic philosophy are applicable and actually profound. It's giving us a blueprint, but maybe the, the script is completely flipped. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so... I think that that's one thing that maybe at least like the flatter side of it, a lot of those people are coming to this understanding like, oh, maybe there is a creator and, you know, they're kind of enamored with that. And maybe that's kind of one of those things that just that mode of consciousness is upsetting the powers that be, despite what the shape of the earth actually is. I don't, I'm not <laughs> arguing for it, but maybe it's the modality of consciousness that's making them angry about that because that represents the square to them. So right. that to me is another perspective that kind of takes it to a different level about all of this. But whether or not that's truth, I don't know. I'm just saying that that's a different way to look at it. Exactly. And that's what I love. I love trying on different hats and looking at things in different ways. And it comes down to after you absorb all this material, who do you trust? Which level of the elevator do you get off on? Like it, you could pick whatever. And that's why I don't really pick a side because I think there's so much manipulation and this stuff is so ancient. And it's just tough because everybody is demonizing their enemies and trying mm -hmm. to influence the profane masses which i guess i'm a part of unfortunately and uh, I'm, I'm proud of it <laughs> <laughs> amen so it is really hard to get a handle on and i do think that's why we see a resurgence of the flat earth idea because now the profane masses think the earth is round and the organizations that have been exploring heliocentrism the big bang and the infinite universe have have these like freemasonic vatican ties in the beginning so the reaction is, okay, that must be the illusion. Mm -hmm. But it does beg the question, if the flat earth understanding 
was originally for the profane masses, how did this, I guess, secret, this higher understanding of the globe earth ever become the standard? Why would they do that? Why would they let that happen? Yeah, and you know, that really just plays into the idea that what is reality, you know, is it the material world or is it the perception of it? And this is why I think the flat earth debate where I'm with it is that I really am fascinated with the psychological reactions or levels of awareness and things that are coming out of people from a metaphysical level psychologically, mm -hmm. that's what's so crazy about it to me, where I don't really actually care either way. Yeah. But maybe that is more of the nature of the reality is people's perceptions of things. So it, it's it's like this enigma. You kind of circle back to well, is this the material world reality or is this just people's perception and is perception really all that matters, you know? And that's where it's like, you know, I don't want to get overly philosophical and stuff like that, but it's it's so hard to make a definitive statement on any of that stuff from my perspective. And I think when you do, that leads you into a polarity. And now all of a sudden you have people, to me, coming from the negative aspects of the flat earth camp. I think Jaronism, you've probably heard of him, right? Right. He did this thing with Max Egan, and Max Egan was providing evidence for these flights. And people in the comments are saying, oh, Max Egan is part of a green screen. He's not even really at this airport. I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> like, I, are you serious? Because they want to believe so badly in the flat earth that when some evidence, as minute as it might be, contradicts that, they're willing to take it to the level that Max Egan is creating a CGI to fool them. I'm just like, are you are you insane? I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and, and that's the thing. That's the negative side. That's the extreme polarity of the flat earth side that I see. And so that's what concerns me. It's that this polarization is the fuel for the people running this. So that's why I just, that's what I'm trying to do with this series is saying that this is all more shades of gray than black and white than people think it is mm -hmm. and if you take it to the extremes you're actually fueling energy for the elites to manipulate and i think at least we can all agree on some level that the elites aren't good now <laughs> people might take the level of the hidden hand okay they are doing something good for us and we just don't understand it i don't personally and i think that most truthers probably don't take that viewpoint so what i'm saying is okay what we do know from their writings and apparently what they self-profess to us on above top secret, if that's legit, is that they use these polarities. So let's not give them that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. That's, that's basically what yeah. I, I would answer that with. Amen. And kind of on the same tip, there's also a, a Kabbalistic connection or an underlying basis for why the prevailing theory about the earth's core is that it's iron, you know, kind of like, the way they took their esoteric philosophy and put out the Big Bang Theory as kind of a, a version of it, that's kind of where the idea that the Earth's core is iron comes from, right? Or at least it jives really well with their Kabbalistic viewpoint. Yeah, yeah. That, the iron core thing is weird. I, I was going to just do something very briefly on that, and then I looked into it a little bit more, and I'm like, hmm, this is very interesting, because in alchemy, you know, each of the planets is assigned a metal. And so Mars is iron. And this is in the nature of the malefics of astrology. And, you know, this might be a little complex for some people who might not be familiar with this. But if you go to, I think it's video 5.1, basically on the tree of life, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with in Kabbalah, you have the spheres on the left pillar, which is the dark pillar. That's the shadow pillar that you're trying to kind of purge and unify with the other side. You have Saturn and Mars, and those are the malefics of astrology. And so they work together in harmony in this dark way. So the devil tarot card is the card for Capricorn. And Capricorn is ruled by Saturn. And that is like the winter solstice, you know, the greatest point of darkness, all these things. And so that is the sign that exalts Mars. So it allows it its highest expression. So if Mars is like this active force, but in its negative sense, that's the duality, the demiurge the destructive, irrational nature of Jehovah, that's that mode of consciousness, that works with Saturn because that's the essence of the Demiurge. They're kind of like, these are different aspects of it, right? 
So those are kind of unified where gravity is associated with the demiurge in Saturn pulling you towards materiality, right? And Capricorn is one of these materialistic signs. I'm a Capricorn, so apparently I'm profane. <laughs> so it's pulling you to the center. And then Mars is the force that has allowed its highest expression through that Saturnian Capricorn energy. And so that is what is working with it. So having the iron core fits the nature of Kabbalah and how they view earth being earth is, you know, profane in its current state. And so everything that's pulling you to the center of materiality, the force is the pan force of Mars. And then the one above that on the tree of life is the false crown, so to speak. So it's weird because it's almost like, well, they've either modeled all these things off of their religion, right? Or there is some truth to that. And it corresponds but you could also say that because this is what I think about the heliocentric stuff. Say the heliocentric model is correct. What if they are taking credit for that with their idea that they're worshiping the one God and that's just the projection and they're just trying to say, hey, we created all this. You know, So you could take the globe argument and argue it that way in the level of human perception and say that they're just trying to take credit for the real creator's work. Who knows? But Right. The point being is that all of these things that we're told in science are very, very profoundly connected to the esoteric stuff. But unless you understand some of these fundamentals about the malefics and stuff like that, you wouldn't really know that. And so that's what I'm just trying to throw out there. I don't know why this is the way it is, but those connections are there, you know? Yeah, man. Cheers to that. I think that is kind of a, a real aha moment that people should have because we've analyzed a lot of this stuff through many shows and of course people do their own digging too and they see these weird connections and yeah just like you said there kind of seems to be three possibilities either these are real discoveries that just happen to validate their secret hidden religion that we don't know about so we're ignorant of it or two they're just applying their religious ideas to questions that we don't really have the answer for yet or to get, yeah, wilder still, they're trying to will these things into existence by making them the dominant worldview firmly planted in the minds of the masses. And like you said earlier, is perception all that matters? That is kind of where we're going with this, right? I mean, it's so interesting. I mean, it's like David Icke says, the perception deception, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, you know, I think some of his comments on the flat earth have been in this nature where he's like, well, what does it really matter because of the perception of it? And it's weird because some people will criticize him for that. But I have a part of me that can agree with that. But I have a part of me that still is, well, what if our senses don't deceive us? You know, it, it's really difficult, man. I'm so torn between a lot of these things that, you know, one day I'll lean and be like, dude, it's flat. This is what they're just <laughs> lying to us. And then another day I'm like, dude, they're fucking with us. Like, I, I just don't know. You know what I mean? So that's why right. I, I don't like making a decision on it. But that that's the question for the audience to answer. That's what I always say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, there's just a real parallel that I think people should think about where just like a biblical literalist wants to say, because this is my paradigm, the earth is only 6,000 years old or whatever. And thus dinosaurs couldn't have existed. They just couldn't. I don't care if you find bones. There couldn't, they couldn't be there because this is my paradigm. Mm -hmm. In that same way, the elite could be saying, well, the earth is an iron core because my religion says it would be because I'm a Kabbalist. That's exactly the point that I'm trying to get across is that right. you still have to realize that maybe they're fighting for their own religion. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But that's the point I'm trying to make. And that's what I kind of appeal in the beginning to people who might be you know, if anybody happens to be in the matrix and they're just pissed off at the flat earthers and they happen to stumble upon my video, I try to make it at least somewhat appealing to them in the beginning. Right. And say that, you know, maybe everything that you've been taught from Neil deGrasse Tyson and whatever, all those people is the mystery religion. So right. you're being taught a religion, yet you hate religion. Isn't that a concern to you? Isn't that a red flag at least to address, you know? Yeah. God, man, that's great. But back to what you said, this is something I haven't, I, I still have a ways to go in the series. I'm probably halfway or two thirds way through. But one thing I want to touch upon is about energy sources. And what's interesting is this relates to astrology, where you have the positive and negative signs of the zodiac. So the positive would basically be like the compass. They come from the deity. The negative comes from Earth. And so the, the reason you might have a negative quality is that's a potential to kind of 
purge the bad things about it and use it to advantage. So for example, like I said, I'm a Capricorn. So instinctively, I'm supposed to be more pessimistic and materialistic and whatever. But the positive qualities is that you're supposed to you know, be good at working hard and have a good work ethic and have a drive, right? So if you use those drives for negative things like pursuing the corporate ladder, oh, I want to use all of my energy and hard work to get a yacht, then that's profaning it. But you have the divine spark, but it's buried. So you have to climb out of that. And if you pursue more spiritual things, that will create better things in your life. And that's something I can resonate with, you know. But the point being is that is a negative quality from the start. So this gets to the energy sources. Right. And we're taught fossil fuels, right? Dinosaur fuels like Tyrannosaurus Rex, the tyrant king of the Demiurge. That's where it comes from. That's black goo oil of Saturn. Those are all terrible fuels that pollute everything and coal and stuff like that. And then we have hydropower, which people say is, you know, better, but not very efficient and still causes environmental destruction. And then we have illuminated sources of the positive of the air of the the solar, right? Because the fire sign obviously is associated with the solar energy, which is positive. And the air sign is a positive sign as well. So we have wind energy and solar energy. It's associated with the positive signs of the zodiac. So we're being told that all of these earthly fuels are profane and all of these positive energy sources are divine. And so some people argue, well, fossil fuels don't even exist and they're very plentiful. So that's a lot of people on the flat earth side will probably argue that way because Eric DeBay, I think, did a whole documentary on dinosaurs not existing and like, you know, fossil fuels not being what they think they are and, you know, nukes being a hoax and all that shit. And that, you know, that's something for anybody to decide on their own. I'm not giving an opinion on those things, but the fact remains is those esoteric archetypes and modalities are interwoven into our energy sources. And I'm just like, man, that's so weird. Yeah, (laughs) it is, man. And maybe that's why they've fought for oil and kind of basically shoehorned us into just that one energy source. You could say coal, also black, these uh, weird black Saturnian things. I don't know. It is uh, really interesting, though. And, well, man, I love this. I could do it all day, and I definitely find these ideas provocative, and I love trying to wrap my head around new angles. So I really appreciate you bringing all this to the table. I think it's damn near criminal that you don't have more views and subscribers on this YouTube channel. Of course, there will be links in the show notes, but anyone interested should definitely go through it. I think it's deeper and more informative than a lot of paid classes on the same kind of stuff. So great job, man. Well, thank you. And I appreciate it. And one thing I'd like to mention is that in my videos, I have a link that goes to a Dropbox that has all the references for everything I talk about. And anything I talk about in the video that I don't provide a reference for on the screen is probably in the references link. So I want to be able to source everything as transparently as possible. It's like, this is where I'm drawing from and check it out for yourself. You know, if you come to a different conclusions on what Blavatsky says here or there, that's fine. But I'm just trying to be open about it so people can make up their own minds about it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's great. I do have a lot of people who come to me and I ask them, you know, what do you get out of THC or why do you like it? And they like this show because they consider it a crash course and a lot of these really deep topics and theories that they just don't really have time to get into at that serious depth. And I think that that's what's great about your series is a lot of this material is intimidating because it is so expansive and each individual author you go into has like 10 books, so it can be pretty tough. And you provide a kind of a crash course, I would say even, um, I think that's selling it short. I think it's a little more in depth than that, but you really do kind of fill that role of, introducing people to a lot of deep stuff and giving them the context of exactly where it came from, kind of the cliff notes to a lot of really deep and complex stuff. So it's great. And before we go, is there any other contact information or follow-up information that the people should get before we get out of here? Uh, Not really. What you see is what you get on the YouTube. I cool. am backing stuff up on Vimeo. I don't really like it there because they only allow you to upload stuff in increments and I'm not going to pay tons of money for it because I already pay enough money for a lot of these books. And, you know, if anything I would offer is like, you know, definitely if you, if you want to go in more depth on these things on your own, 
buy some of the books that I'm sourcing from and, and read it for yourself because I, it would be helpful if more people looked at the stuff and maybe could make other applications because I'm just one person and I can't, you know, I, I have my own strengths and weaknesses and, you know, I can only give out so much. So if, if people really want to look more into that, I really encourage people to look at it for themselves. But I think the most fundamental thing is to think about what is the esoteric and exoteric version from their viewpoint. Always try to look at it from their viewpoint and then think, well, what is my viewpoint? You know what I mean? And I think that that will help people in their interactions with other people and maybe alleviate some of the tension that happens from some of these misconceptions about what all these folks believe. So, mm, Cheers to that. And man, your recall and synthesis is just super impressive to my simple stoner mind. But damn, deepest show in a while, I'd have to say. So interesting stuff. Thanks for being here, man. Hopefully we can do it again sometime. Yeah, anytime uh, something catches your interest, give me a shout. I usually have pretty good availability and I just appreciate the opportunity and uh, thank you. I've I've always enjoyed your demeanor and wow. your intros <laughs> and your objectivity. I, I think that you're one of my favorite. This is not being like, you know, a brown noser. I'm being honest. Like, I really enjoy your level of being able to play devil's advocate on things because I think that's important. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do here in a way that's just presenting different viewpoints. And that's one of the reasons why I think that I resonate so much with your general vibe and personality and i'm just happy to have been a part of this ha huh, too kind man but you know some of those other hosts out there they set the bar pretty low so um <laughs> you know can't take too much credit but i appreciate it and uh keep fighting the good fight all right thanks a lot greg michael joseph ladies and gentlemen i hope you liked this one because i actually think it's a home run even though there is a lot of speculation and that kind of, well, you could look at it this way or you could look at it that way kind of thing, I still really enjoy it. And I do urge you all to check out Michael's YouTube channel, Schism206. S-C-H-I-S-M-206. He's got so much material. It's very fascinating. And the guy has less than 500 subscribers. And we can fix that. I'm also super impressed with just how much he's absorbed and digested in such a short period of time. I'm surprised that this hasn't been like a lifelong study because the Boston bombing wasn't all that long ago. Or did he say Sandy Hook? I think it was Boston, but both are pretty fairly recent rabbit hole starting points. What I like most about this episode is that ever since Crow and Eric Dubay, those early shows where we really stretch these ideas of how different our construct could really be, and then NASA's role in perpetuating the deception, there has been a lot of talk around that nexus of science and occult beliefs, symbolism and names and NASA missions, invoking mythology, etc., all that stuff. But we were kind of fumbling around in the dark. Obviously, there is something there to talk about. We see some things that give us pause, but it was pretty clunky, if that makes sense. I just think this conversation with Michael smooths out at least some of the wrinkles in there, and it's a more measured and nuanced look at what this is, rather than a dramatic, paranoid, reactionary, they're all Satanists type of talk. Between the moon landing stuff, the Neil deGrasse Tyson stuff, and the Earth's Iron Core stuff, a lot clicked for me here. It's like I knew they were making some things up, I knew it had to do with their beliefs, but I guess I just feel that I can articulate what they may be trying to do a bit better now. I think it goes a long way towards rectifying this idea of secret societies and Freemasons invoking Lucifer, this Lightbringer character, talking about enlightenment and the evolution of mankind, and then rectifying that with their negative actions. Maybe. I could see this conversation being so objective that it's damn near cold-hearted, but it is what it is. It's one of my favorites lately, and Michael is a guy that I think I could have on quite a few more times, but let me know what you think. I also did find a hilarious critique of myself and the Higher Side Chats and our trustworthiness. I posted it on Facebook and Twitter. You can find it there. I actually <laughs> like it quite a bit for a couple of reasons, but a common thing that gets brought up is, why do I use Freemasonic symbolism? 
I'm probably a secret Freemason. And the show is suspiciously good for one lone stoner in San Diego. And I think that is quite a badge of honor in a lot of ways. But I'm definitely not a Freemason. I really am just a independent, interested party. But if I need to explain why that symbolism makes it into the Higher Side Chat's marketing images, it's because I want someone to know exactly what kind of show it is when they haven't heard of it before if they only see the logo. We can go back to the old logo of the microphone and the eye with the squid tentacles. We got, yeah, a Freemasonic square and compass in there, a UFO, a police baton, money, and a swinging hypnotist pocket watch. These are just conspiratorial symbols in general, and I'm in no way more associated with Freemasons than I am UFOs. They're both in the image. I then thought a little bit deeper and was like, well, you know, if someone was really skeptical about me and like followed me around and looked at my car, it probably wouldn't look good that I do have a Freemasonic square and compass on my vehicle. <laughs> the reason for that is I bought it off Amazon for $2 as an experiment to see if it would help me with police interactions. I have to say, I have not been pulled over since I put that on my car. My fiance has not been pulled over since we put one on her car. And I thought that if by chance one of us did get pulled over and it was referenced by the police officer, all we would have to say is, oh, you know, my dad put that on the window. Didn't really say much about it, but that's his deal. And it might work. It might actually get me out of some kind of ticket without having to know the secret handshake or anything like that. So there isn't much of a point to that tangent, just that it is a common criticism that I seem to use Freemasonic imagery, but I consider it conspiratorial imagery. But if I was connected and was going through this as some sort of psyop, the evidence would not be that obvious. I mean, what kind of sense would that make? Sometimes conspiracy folks think that everything has to be tagged so that there is a truth revealed there, and that's just not the case. But maybe I'm digging myself a bigger hole. Anyway, if you liked the first hour of this episode, as always, there's a second hour for the THC Plus members, and I try to bring you a healthy dose of education and speculation with the best guests on some of the most interesting fringe topics out there. And all I ask is that if you like that first hour, you sign up as a member for the full show for five bucks a month, five episodes a month, 10 hours of content, keeping it simple. And in this episode, in that second hour, we talk about the hollow earth and concave earth in esoteric literature, the trapped on a prison planet and the aftermath of a cosmic war idea that the elite might be trying to facilitate a jailbreak through various magical and scientific means. Remember the Joseph Farrell episode on this? The Treaty of Versailles template? I thought that was a real great one. Definitely worth revisiting or checking out if you missed it. Uh, we also talked about the esoteric subtext and astrology of the moon landing ritual, gravity in the context of this secret religion, some accounts of ancient schisms among the elite that might still be affecting us today, and the campaign of the knowledge seeders, one part I really loved was the esoteric symbolism around the death of David Bowie, the Jack Stevens element, and how that could be an example of a larger pattern. One of the better breakdowns of that I've heard. Good job, Michael. And then a little something that has been kind of the bread and butter of today's guest, which is the astrology of the JFK assassination and the numerous rituals that seem to have been rolled into that one event. And we throw in some talk about the elite's connection to non-human entities for good measure. I hope this is the kind of episode that makes some listeners finally pull the trigger on supporting Plus. Also, Michael Joseph gave me one of his own songs to play out this episode of THC. It's a sample from an album he's going to be releasing in the future. The song is called Johnny North. Do enjoy it. And I declare this meeting of the Midnight Society officially closed. And I'll see you next time. Your move, adept occultist of the power pyramid and high priest of the private religion behind the curtain, your fucking.
Hey guys, thanks for listening to the first hour of the Higher Side Chats podcast with me, Greg Carlwood. If you don't know, there is a second hour to all the episodes we do around here. Generally, we're able to get a lot deeper into the topics and ideas that a guest is about. So if you enjoyed what you've heard from THC for free, consider signing up at thehiresidechatsplus.com to get the second hour of the five shows I put together each month. I never really wanted to be a paid subscriber podcast, but I really hate the idea of spending airtime promoting some product that's completely unrelated and telling you the best way to support the show is to buy an audiobook or new underwear by mail or something crazy like that. So instead, if you like the show, double your time with it for five bucks a month and let's cut out all the other shit. It's half the price of a movie ticket and you get at least an extra five hours of show a month. Collectively, it keeps us stable and it frees me from wasting your time with anything but the show you came to listen to. It's really the only way for an independent, one-man show to make it, and I do what I can so that it's worth your while. Since we started this, I've always tried to use the subscriptions to improve the podcast and make signups more advantageous. It started with just a second hour for the main show, but now we've got a nice forum going where people can get deeper in conversation about the episodes with other listeners submit a candidate in the guest request thread, or share their own personal projects to get out of the soul-crushing 9-to-5 cog-in-the-wheel life on the Entrepreneur's thread. The forum and the plus comments are always the first places I try to go for listener engagement, but it does get harder as the show gets more popular. Because of that, there's also a direct messaging feature that you can use to reach me through the plus site also. But beyond the form, if you like any of the music I've used for THC, most of it I've hired artists to make, and I provide it all as free downloads to Plus members too. So if you like a particular song you've heard close the show out recently, come get the MP3. I should also mention that if you don't like the idea of paying $5 recurring every month, I get that. You can buy three months, six months, or a year up front and just be done with it. I have plenty of listeners who send checks and money orders to the P.O. Box too, I try to make it as easy for people as I can, and you can read more about it on the sign-up page. Also, be sure to check out the FAQ help page on the Plus site if you have any questions or concerns about how to listen to a password-protected show on your devices. I've highlighted a lot of great solutions, and one of those would be the iPhone app that just recently hit the Apple App Store. A super kind and talented listener made it for us, and you can use it to stream or download either the free or the Plus show. If you're on Android, I'd use Pocket Casts or Podcast Addict and subscribe to the feed manually that way. I also try to throw in occasional bonus shows or Q&A shows, and I've got a few other weird ideas I might get to try out soon. But I give you all I can for 5 bucks, and I hope you'll at least give it a shot if you've listened to a few free shows and you find them unique or valuable. I know there's a lot of podcasts out there, and I'm just one of them. But if you have any questions, concerns, or comments about any of this, please get in touch with us at the Higher Side Chats team at gmail.com. I also wanted to plug the Higher Side newsletter I'm going to be putting out, totally free for anyone who wants to sign up at the main internet website for the show, thehiresidechats.com. You can also get on that email list through the Higher Side Chats Facebook page. There's a button there as well. But the reason I'm doing this is because I get tons and tons of emails after a show goes up asking me about how I feel about a particular guest or topic, and the wrap-up isn't always the best place to do that, especially if I have anything negative to say. Sometimes the dust needs to settle. Sometimes I need to hear feedback from you guys first. There are a lot of factors, but I usually have something to communicate to you, and I just don't get to do it. So on the first of the month, I plan to send out a little newsletter with my thoughts about the five shows the previous month, and talk to you about anything else that's on my mind or that's going on. 
And what's probably most enticing is that I'm going to give you some insight into at least one guest I have coming up in the month, which people have been begging for some posted schedule for a long time. I personally think I'd like the surprise. But sign up for the Higher Side newsletter. It's free. It comes out on the first of the month, and I won't waste your time with any other emails. And that's it. I appreciate you listening. I try to give alternative ideas and guests a fair shake on a high-quality podcast, expose some deep-level conspiracies without the yelling, and I hope to offer some inspiration that even though the system relentlessly suggests you should follow their blueprint to mediocrity, you can do your own thing and live a much happier life despite all the negativity in the world. So go ahead and treat yourself. Isn't it about time? <laughs>